Hi everyone, I'm Mike Bird. You might know me from my previous videos such as Toilet Hygiene, Putting the Book of Leviticus into Practice, and Six and a Half Reasons Why Tom Hanks is the Antichrist. Well, today I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm not doing one of my Texts and Traditions videos or Nazareth to Nicaea videos. I want to do five reasons why you should be Anglican, or five reasons why it's okay to be Anglican. And here, I have to say, I'm responding to Lutheran pastor slash podcaster slash influencer slash man with a beard so lush it could be indicted for heteronormative hate crimes in California, none other than Jordan B. Cooper. Uh, you might know him from his podcast, Justin Center. He produces some pretty, some pretty cool YouTube videos, which are always worth checking out. And I uh, re-stumbled upon one of his older ones uh, about uh, why I'm not Anglican, where you're supposed to give five reasons not to be Anglican. But in Jordan's case, he said he only needed one reason not to be Anglican. And as someone who is proudly Anglican uh, and Reformed, I like to think, I thought I would offer my own response to Jordan uh, Cooper and his somewhat Lutheran-esque critique of Anglicanism. Now, I have to say from the outset, it's kind of hard to determine what type of Anglicanism uh, Jordan's responding to. Is he responding to the global Anglican communion? Is he responding to the ACNA, the Anglican Communion North America? Is he responding to the Episcopal Church? Because the, these are somewhat um, different Anglican creatures in their own way. And I'm going to assume, I'm going to, I think I'm going to assume rightly, he's talking mostly about the ACNA as the type of Anglicans he seems to stumble upon in his own uh, circles. And he basically gives one major reason why he is not Anglican. And that comes down to doctrinal unity. And he says in the sense that the Anglicans are so diverse that obviously they don't have any. Uh, out of all the criticisms you could make of Anglicanism, I thought that one was the poorest because we do have doctrinal unity. And you see that in the 39 Articles, which is a Protestant confession of the Anglican churches, and also in the Book of Common Prayer, where our doctrinal unity plays out liturgically. And our doctrine is not merely confessed in a cerebral or a matter of, uh, of a faith as assent. It's lived out in the liturgies of the Anglican Church, represented in the Book of Common Prayer. Now, the, the quintessential Book of Common Prayer is the 1662 prayer book. Yes, that has precursors, and it has something of a development all the way up to about 1928 and a few different prayer books around the communion. But they are all reflections of uh, the 1662 prayer book. And and I, I would say as well that that means Anglicans are not ideationally vacuous. We do have a confession of faith. We are part of the Reformed churches of the world. We owe our heritage to the Reformation and we're linked not just by worship. I mean, that's something that gets pushed in some more liberal or progressive Anglican churches. They like to say, oh, well, we don't have doctrine, doctrinal unity. We just have liturgical unity. That is demonstrably false. That's never been the name of the game in Anglicans, that's that's more of a recent innovation. And I would say our unity is not just structural. It's not just a, about being related to the Church of England and its Episcopal governments. There is a there is a doctrinal unity, and that doctrinal unity, however, does not require homogeneity. So you can have some different views on things. And one thing that Anglicans are known for being tolerant on is diverse views of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. Now, this goes back to the Elizabethan settlement. 
So you're dealing with a time in English church history where there are those who are still kind of clinging on to their Catholic views of the Lord's Supper. There are those who like Luther. There are those who like Calvin. There are those who like Zwingli and endless variations thereof. So the church decided, or the, the government of England, the Queen and the Crown, said there would be a level of uh, flexibility, there would be a level of tolerance and charity when it came specifically to views of the Eucharist. Now, some people have tried to take that tolerance and apply it to all the doctrines, as if even the Trinity is kind of take it or leave it. That's not the case. That flexibility, that tolerance was only meant to apply to the Eucharist because of debates, not just between Protestants and Catholics, but because of debates within Protestantism itself. Okay. Now, Jordan also brings up the topic of women in ministry. So, I mean, he makes the complaint, well, I mean, how can you be in a denomination or a diocese where you've got two different views of women in ministry? How is that possible? Uh, well, it is possible and it does work. I'm in a diocese where we do have different views of women in ministry. We have some kind of full on full Monty egalitarians such as myself. And then we have all sorts of complementarians. I mean, I know female priests, ordained Anglican priests who are complementarian. They're very happy to be a priest, but they would never aspire to be a bishop. So we have every type of complementarian uh, you can imagine in the diocese as well. And the reason we can do that is because we recognize that there is a triage of theological beliefs. There are the essentials, things like, you know, the Trinity. Then there are things which are, you know, are important. Uh, that may be the view of the Eucharist or, you know, women in ministry and the like. And then there's tertiary matters. Um, you know, uh, how do you take communion? Do you do a common cup? Uh, do you have all the little cups? Can you do in intinction and the like? Uh, and Jordan also raises the issue of unity because it, it affects real important uh, theological issues like justification by faith, which, you can, as you can imagine, for a Lutheran such as himself, is a very important topic. And on that score, the Anglican churches are definitely reformed. But I do want to point out that during the Reformation, uh, justification by faith could be understood differently. Okay, I, I would argue that the reformed views are generally reflective of a forensic justification. I would say that's probably the, the, the main characteristic of a reformed view, as opposed to a an infusion of grace that enables you to do works of charity that make you become righteous. But even amongst the reformers, there was a lot of diversity. If you compare, for example, the Augsburg Confession with the Tetrapolitan Confession, you can see some differences. There's different ways of appropriating the Augustinian heritage when it comes to creating a reformed view of justification. You can also see different views between the relationship uh, between regeneration and justification, uh, different views between justification and sanctification. I mean, in Lutheranism, they're very big that justification and sanctification need a kind of, you know, um, separation order between them. You know, sanctification cannot come within 10 feet of justification or we may end up turning Catholic. Whereas Calvin doesn't have that kind of paranoia. Someone like Calvin can say that uh, the grace for righteousness as our status and the grace for righteousness as a way of life and imperative, they are both in union with Christ. And that's what Calvin called the duplex gratia, the twofold grace. We get justification as a status and justification as a state, as a moral state that we progress in, and they're both apprehended in union with Christ. Luther does not have that. So even the reformers had diverse views of justification by faith. Luther definitely wasn't the only game playing in town. But probably one of my chief complaints against Jordan here was a lot of the criticisms he made about Anglicanism, I reckon, could be made against Lutheranism. If you look not just at, you know, one particular denomination of Lutheranism in North America, but if you look at the Lutheran World Federation, then those same criticisms amply apply. You could say, is there doctrinal unity 
in the Lutheran World Federation. So if you've got Lutherans from, say, Sweden, Bavaria, South Africa, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, Brazil, and you got them all together, would they have the same views on theology, on ecumenical matters? Would they have the same view on justification by faith? Would they have the same view on, I don't know, socialism or euthanasia or a whole bunch of different issues? Uh, and certainly the ordination of women and LGBT issues are obviously a very diverse and a fractious issue in the World Lutheran Federation. And that kind of uh, goes to show that, you know, we're not, we're, Anglicans not the only ones who, dis, who struggle with doctrinal unity. I think that's probably an issue in all churches around the world, even in the Catholic Church, you know, Baptist, Methodist, wherever you are, the idea, uh, the problem of what are, of identifying what are the key doctrines we all have to agree on. Uh, that has been a, a point of contention, well, probably since the rise of modernity. Uh, to that end, I, I did have some problems with the type of Lutheranism that Jordan was advocating, because you're saying, you know, Lutherans are really big on doctrinal unity. Uh, the problem is that unity sounded more like uniformity and the quest for doctrinal homogeneity, where everyone believes literally the same thing about everything. And I find that incredibly problematic because you can have unity without diversity. That's easy. That's what I, I think uh, Jordan is aiming for, the ideal or the current practice of Lutheranism. Uh, and you can have diversity without any kind of doctrinal unity. And that's probably what you get in mainline Protestants. You know, you bring an oh, blessed that type of thing. But it is hard to have unity and diversity together. Uh, and I would argue that both are biblical. You know, there is the faith once delivered unto the saints. Paul in Romans 6.17 can say, keep to the teachings that you were instructed. He can tell the Corinthians, you know, what I received, I passed on to you. You know, you know that kind of thing. But a bit of diversity uh, is normal, and it's there at the very beginning. You, you see Paul in Romans 14 and 15 saying, look, yeah, we can have diverse views on tertiary matters. You know, we can have different views of which day we observe. We can have different views about, you know, uh, what food we could be consuming. Now, a lot of this is related to how much of the Jewish law continues into largely Gentile churches, but you, you get the idea. It's okay to have a difference of convictions. And Paul tells the Roman a cluster of congregations, welcome one another as the Messiah welcomed you. And we could talk about other diversities in the New Testament. I mean, I believe James and Paul in their respective uh, letters uh, have a clear sense of unity on justification by faith and faith working through love. But they apply Genesis 15, 6 very differently. There's different views in the New Testament about whether you can consume food sacrificed to idols. I mean, Paul basically has a don't ask, don't tell policy. John the seer is dead set against it. So a, a little bit, bit of diversity is tolerable as long as you have an evangelical unity. And that's what Paul defends in places like Galatia when he defends justification by faith, when he defends the resurrection in 1 Corinthians, or when he defends his own ministry of advancing the gospel in Philippians. And, you know, diversity is, is, is therefore uh, simply part of the way I think any church connected to the scriptures and to Christianity is going to be. There's always going to be a unity in diversity. And, and that diversity even extends to the Protestant churches. You know, that there's different ways of being reformed. There's Lutheran, there's Baptist, there's, you know, Continental Reformed, there's, you know, all different ways of, of, of doing that. And there is a thing called the World uh, Reformed Churches, if I've got that right, where you have a number of confessional groups that, that get together ever so often, and they are united because they've got confessions that come out of the Reformation. And there's also diverse ways of even being Lutheran. You know, I, I've met a few different Lutherans in my time across the world, in Germany, in America. But the danger is if you, if you disregard that imperative of maintaining 
uh, some degree of healthy diversity, if you focus just on unity and homogeneity, uh, ultimately you can end up with a very curatorial Christianity. Rather than become missional, you're simply focused on maintaining the homogeneity. And I would say that's probably one of the weaknesses of contemporary Lutheranism as I see it. I, I've, I've been doing the, the theological scene for a while now. Uh, I've come across a handful of Lutheran churches. I've never met any Lutheran church planners. Uh, I haven't come across any Lutheran missionaries. I haven't come across uh, Lutherans interacting with wider, you know, Christian groups, evangelical groups, reform groups. Uh, around the world. And this, this idea that you must have absolute doctrinal homogeneity, uh, I think is danger, dangerous because you end up becoming isolationist and introspective. You end up becoming curatorial rather than missional, where your only mission is really to maintain the homogeneity. And I wonder if that's part of the reason why uh, Lutherans appear so almost invisible to me because they, they just literally keep themselves to themselves. And, and, and there is a salient warning here because Australia used to have a very thriving Lutheran population. They came to Australia largely in the 1880s, particularly in the cities of Adelaide and in Toowoomba, in my home state of Queensland. There were very big uh, Lutheran populations. But today, those, those Lutherans, those Lutheran churches most of them are now childcare centers or their restaurants or their pubs. And I mean, there are you know, still a few Lutheran churches around. I mean, my, my Dr. Fata was a very nice Lutheran chap. But yeah, I mean, if, if that's where Lutheran ecclesiology gets you, the focus on homogeneity, then it's not going to lend itself to a natural missional or evangelistic imperative or thrust. And I think maybe the radical decline of Lutheranism in Australia uh, might be a warning for other Lutherans around the world. Hashtag just saying. But beyond that, let me give you uh, what I think are the five best reasons to be Anglican. So let me let me hit you up with them. Okay, number one, you get to be Protestant and Catholic. My good friend, John Dixon, who is the Everyone Loves Raymond of Evangelicalism, uh, John Dixon said, Anglicanism at its best is what the Catholic Church would look like if it embraced the Reformation. You know, I, I think that generally holds. Uh, Anglicanism is a reformed, a reformed church, but it's holding on to the heritage, the past, the Catholicity. Okay, so we're not like those sort of churches that assume like, okay, let's assume everyone prior to Luther was a thief and a robber. Now, I know that's definitely not Jordan Cooper's view, but some people do think like that. You know, people who are unsure if there were any Christians between 100 AD and, you know, 1517, that type of a thing. So, yeah, I mean, you get to, you get to have both. You get to embrace the Reformation and the Reformation as the attempt to reform the church and take it back to its apostolic roots and to main things like Catholicity. And that means as Anglicans, we can embrace both senses of apostolicity. We can embrace apostolicity as the recovery of the apostolic gospel. Okay, that's that's the, the key point of the Reformation. But we can also maintain apostolicity in the sense of apostolic succession, that our church is organically, historically linked to the church of the Latin West and ultimately to the church of the apostles in the Eastern Mediterranean all the way back to Jerusalem and Pentecost. We've got both senses of apostolicity. Second reason to be Anglican the Book of Common Prayer. Now, I read many years ago that the great biblical scholar, F.F. F. Bruce, though he was brethren, kept two things on his desk, a Greek New Testament and the Book of Common Prayer. And that's how I got into the Book of Common Prayer. I thought, well, you know, worked out pretty good for FFB, so I started reading it myself. And it was pretty cool. Uh, amazing written out prayers, 
you know, things that are Trinitarian, regular diet of Gospels and epistles. Uh, it gives life a certain rhythm and calendar, and I, I think it's it's pretty pretty awesome. And uh, let me add to that, um, the way the Book of Common Prayer applies in different parts of the world uh, means that people can kind of supplement it or you know, add to it with their own local liturgies inspired from the traditional ones. So let me give you a good example of that. Uh, if you've ever read or ever participated in the Kenyan Anglican Church celebration of the Lord's Supper, like, oh boy, that that is something to behold. That's something you need to put on your bucket list because you have not celebrated the Lord's Supper unless you've done it Kenyan Anglican style. That, that's, that's all I'll say. So uh, number three, we have the via media, but not as you think. Uh, a lot of people suppose that the Anglican Church is the via media between Protestantism and Catholicism. And that's not that's that's not true. Now I said in my first point, uh, one of the advantages of Anglicanism is you get to be Protestant and Catholic. So you're trying to retrieve the gospel to reform the Catholic Church and maintain both senses of apostolicity. But Anglicanism is, is not a via media between, say, Lutheranism and Catholicism. And, and this is important. Anglicanism is a, is a via media, but it's between Lutheranism and the Reformed view. Okay, so it is a kind of halfway between um, Wittenberg and Geneva, not between Rome and Wittenberg, if you like, between Lutheranism. So Anglicanism was designed to be a kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, a pan-Protestant movement or something of a, of, a, um, of a working Protestant hypothesis that could be maximally inclusive. So it, it could appreciate some uh, Lutheran concerns, you know, particularly on things like justification by faith. But you've also got the influence there of people like uh, well, Calvin and definitely, I think, Martin Buse, Buser as well. I think Martin Buser is probably a very big influence on the Anglican Reformation. So, yeah, it is a it is a via media, but not between Rome and Lutheranism, rather between Lutheranism and the Reformed churches. Uh, the fourth element of uh, Anglicanism that I think makes it attractive is unity and diversity. OK, now in, in those senses in which I was talking about, you've got to have both. You've got to have unity but you've got to be willing to accommodate diversity as well. And you see that in you know, different approaches to the Eucharist, those who want a somewhat more, shall we say, Anglo-Catholic understanding, a reformed understanding or Zwingling or memorial. You do find a range of views in the Anglican communion. And look, we also, we also debate other things as well, such as you know, lay presidency at communion. Can a lay person preside at communion? And this is, I think this is good because you need a triage. You, 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 you can't have literally like a free for all, like you bring it and I'll bless it, but you can't have homogeneity, you know, on everything, demanding that everyone agrees on everything. You need a triage between the, 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 the essential beliefs, things that are important, but I'm not going to shipwreck your soul. And then what are matters of conscience and convicting, uh, matters of conviction. And Anglicanism has always been very keen on avoiding extremists. We might say colloquially, they want to avoid the extremes of both the Papists and the Puritans. So they, they don't want the kind of, well, let's fully embrace uh, the Roman way of doing things and go back to uh, communion with the Church of Rome. I mean, some people have taken that step, Cardinal Newman being the the obvious one, but they've also been concerned about pro um, Protestant or Puritan extremists who want to keep purifying and purifying and purifying the church till it gets smaller. And in some sense, uh, that tension has been around at different times. So with the Tractarians, um, you know, with Newman, uh, I think Pusey and, and others, you do get that that sort of you know desire to go back to a medieval Catholicism, um, you know, someone fantasizing uh, about you know King Arthur and his bishops, that kind of a thing, and how that plays out in the late nineteenth century. Uh, but then you also get people who effectively wanted to turn Anglicans into hardcore Presbyterians. So there's always been those sort of you know tensions there, and Anglicans have generally tried to avoid both extremes. You might call them the the Papists 
and the Puritans, which means we, we tend to have a lot of com accommodation for everything you find in between. Uh, fifth reason for being Anglican, uh, all the cool kids are doing it. I mean, we've got C.S. Lewis, you've got Alistair McGrath, N.T. Wright, J.I. Packer, John Stott, Fleming Rutledge, and now we just picked up Beth Moore. Uh, and, and in America, some of the some of the best people I know are Anglican, like es Esau McCulley, Tish Warren, Amy Peeler. I like seriously, I mean, Scott McKnight. I mean, yeah, all the cool kids are doing it. And uh, Jordan, if you're listening, uh, I'll have you know, uh, uh, I could arrange for you to be received into the Anglican communion you you can keep the beard you can keep the beard but we could definitely get you get you accepted into the anglican communion now let me be brutally honest though let me be brutally honest say there are some downsides to anglicanism you know uh, I, it's it's not all it's not all you know chasubles seasonal colors and all the cool stuff and prayer books and Canterbury Trail stuff, there is a downside, okay? Number one, the origin story. Uh, we have to admit that the, the initial thrust for Anglicanism did come from the king's problem. King Henry VIII needed to find a wife who could give him a male baby. You know, that's, that's, that's kind, of, kind of how it started. But I mean, that wasn't the be all and end all. That was simply provided the opportunity for Britain to embrace the Reformation, for the English Reformation, or as, or as I call it, the original Brexit, okay? So the King's problem became the provident, providential opportunity for the English church to embrace the Reformation. Uh, but it was a bit of a tussle. And yeah, we do have to remember that it kind of goes back to King Henry VIII and the King's problem. But that's not the be all and end all of it, okay? Uh, the other thing we have to point out is Anglicanism spread partly through evangelism, but through evangelism on the coattails of the British Empire. So as the British Empire spread uh, and brought with it everywhere it went, both blessing and a whole lot of bane and probably more emphasis on the Bane in parts of, you know, South Africa, India, Argentina, everywhere around the world. Yeah, Anglicanism spread on the coattails of the English Empire. And we have to acknowledge that. And that means we've got to wrestle with our colonial past and how the church was often complicit with that uh, colonialism, but also pointing out how the church tried to uh, restrain, uh, stop, and interdict the abuses of the British Empire. So there's a very complex history there. Uh, but things that require both uh, rejoicing, that we became a worldwide communion, but also things for lamenting and repenting of as well. Uh, the other downside is uh, with our willingness to accommodate and embrace theological diversity, that has always led to the problem of how much theological diversity you can tolerate. And as I'm doing this video, there is a conference ending in Rwanda, I believe, in Kilgali, where basically the majority of the world's Anglicans are deciding that they don't really want to hang out with the Archbishop of Canterbury anymore. And this is related to views about um, same-sex marriage attitudes towards scripture what are the the bonds within the anglican communion the instruments of unity we have and how they are or are not functioning properly or improperly so there are some downsides to being anglicanism we haven't really worked out a way to resolve those differences whether we end up going like the methodist in america and try have an amicable divorce or whether we find a way to live together even with our differences as they are, or whether we end up with two kind of parallel Anglican communions, which is, you know, not ideal, uh, but could be on the cards. So that in a nutshell is why I uh, disagree with Jordan Cooper's critique of Anglicanism, because we do have doctrinal unity and they're the five reasons I can give you for being Anglican. 
Uh, otherwise, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, feel free to check out some of my other videos, which tend to be a little bit more serious, by the way. Otherwise, I will see you around the channel.